day, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? <laughs> great, I hope everyone said well. I heard a couple of wells in there, right? Good, great, well, great. Today we are gonna go do a long overdue vlog for me. When I um, graduated from high school, a friend of mine, Adam, turned me on to a lot of new music at the time. And one of the things that he turned me on to that I'd never heard was Beach Boys Pet Sounds, which as soon as I heard it, it became my all-time favorite record. I listened to it continuously from the time that I graduated till the time I moved out to Los Angeles. Wherever I would go, I would either listen to Pavement or the Beach Boys Pet Sounds. It just became kind of a soundtrack. And I started reading about Brian Wilson's life when I moved out here and read about his Smile album that at the time I was reading about it in 2000 had never come out. It was this long-awaited album that he was going to release and follow up Pet Sounds, but it never came out. So today, we're going to go to the house, and I'm going to tell you the stories about Pet Sounds, Good Vibrations, and what happened to Smile. Now what's interesting is that in the time that I moved out here, pretty much right as soon as I moved out here, Brian Wilson announced that he was doing a symphonic tour well, at first it started out as a one night only thing at the Hollywood Bowl, so I bought tickets and got to see Brian perform Pet Sounds with a symphony. Eventually he took it on the road, and then about a decade later, his band talked him into releasing Smile, that long awaited album that was announced in 1960, I think it was supposed to come out in January of 67, and it never came out. So he ended up with his band re recording it and releasing it, so I got to see that in concert as well. But today, like I said, I want to take you to the house that he was living in when he was creating all that great music and tell what was going on in the Beach Boys' life at that time and why that album didn't come out. Days with Jordan the Lion, it begins now. I think perhaps we should take you out for a walk before we do anything, right? Before we do any Brian Wilson, we have to do jaw time. Let's do it. So today's special Patreon sunglass vlog, some kind of colorful sunglasses because this was kind of a colorful time in Brian Wilson's life. These are for Tad Dillard. Tad, I hope you enjoy your Patreon sunglass vlog. Just taking the buddy out for his morning walk. We got rain last night, so we can't go to the PARK. Too wet. See what I mean? So I'm really looking forward to today's vlog. I gotta be honest, I can't wait to see this house. I've never seen it, but some of my favorite music of all of Los Angeles history was invented up there so the creative juices were really flowing we'll get to see it today hear all the crazy stories today's vlog takes us into beverly hills well right here's our street sign buried behind these trees that is it so as you drive up here you can see there are just tons and tons of vehicles these are all people working on rebuilding houses and everything up here. But I want you to see the pathway up to his house because I'm gonna tell you a little Van Dyke Park story about him coming up here, taking this same route while we're up here. And you can probably tell by my angle that this is all uphill, which also kind of goes into the story I'll tell you. So to give you a little bit of a backstory on the Beach Boys up until this point, the Beach Boys formed when Brian Wilson basically was in prep college. He had finished high school and he and his brothers were musically inclined. Their father had tried to write songs and didn't have any success to speak of as a musician, but his sons were really good and Murray saw that. And even though Murray was kind of a tyrant as a father, he saw that his sons had a really great gift and they formed the Beach Boys. Now, Murray was their manager and helped them secure a deal with Capitol Records. And in those days, bands were expected to produce a hit, you know, every two to three months. And they would also put out full albums two, three times a year. So Brian, for the last two or three years, had been the leader of the Beach Boys. He had had numerous hits, co-writing with Mike Love and other members of the band, but primarily it was Brian's ear that was writing these hit songs and in 1964 he had just had enough of his father and he fired Murray from being the manager of the band. 
Murray went on to be kind of disgruntled about this and would even later on hire private detectives to spy on Brian. But Brian was touring with the band for a while early on in the early days of the Beach Boys, but he just on one tour had a breakdown at the end of 1964 while on tour and just decided he couldn't write the music and tour and he just he really from what i've read he just didn't enjoy the touring aspect of it he was getting homesick he would miss his wife marilyn or you know early on the days it was his girlfriend marilyn he would miss his mom and so when he would leave the tour and come back he wanted his mom to actually pick him up because he was having a little bit of an emotional breakdown so he decided to focus on creating the music here in los angeles while they would hire another member of the band or to fill in Brian Spot, Bruce Johnson, and they would go on to um, keep touring while Brian would make the music at home and he would have hit after hit. Now he said um, before this house he had lived in Hollywood and someone there had turned him onto marijuana and the first time he never smoked he said it opened up all of his senses. He, he was not particularly religious, but he was spiritual and he said it opened up all of his senses to where when he drank water, he actually tasted and felt more in the water than it ever had. So when somebody turned him on to LSD, which at the time was legal, he had kind of a weird experience of flashing back to his younger days and kind of freaking out for about two hours and then he walked out of the room that he had he had basically done it with some friends and then went and locked himself in a room went through these childhood experiences came out and said well enough of that sat down at a piano and wrote the opening lines for california girls so in 1965 brian decided to buy this house that we're gonna see with his wife marilyn and it looks like they closed officially became the owners at the end of August of 1965 or the first week of September. So that's also when they would have started working on the party album. So this kind of unassuming house right here was the house that they purchased in 1965. They made the party album and it was basically meant to be like a live album in the studio. So they invited friends and they yucked it up and Barbara Ann and things like that were recorded there. But Brian had heard the Beatles' Rubber Soul, and he decided that he wanted to make something more meaningful, something almost symphonic. And so he enlisted um, an ad writer, um, also the guy was also like a copywriter, Tony Asher, to help him work on Pet Sounds. And so Pet Sounds was completely different. It was symphonic. It was just a step beyond anything the Beach Boys had ever done. And it had kind of a heartfelt message, whereas before it was a lot of like teen um, cars and girls and just teen topics, you know? So Brian wanted to go beyond that. And with that album, he did. Now, while he was working on that album, he was actually hearing the parts. He wasn't just going into a studio with studio musicians and saying, what do you think would go here? He could actually hear and show them the parts that he wanted them to do. So this was a big deal. He was the composer, he was the producer, he was just doing it all in the studio. Now, when the boys came back from tour and they heard it, they thought it was a little out there. Um, it just wasn't what they were used to, and Mike Love thought that Brian was messing with the formula that gave them hits. But when the album came out, actually, before the album even came out, um, Lou Adler took a copy and acetate over to um, let Paul McCartney hear, and Paul McCartney like broke out into tears. He just loved it so much. And so uh, Brian even said that when the album came out, both Paul and John of the Beatles called him and told him that, that that album was an inspiration to them. And so the Beach Boys gave Brian his creative outlet there. But like I said, Mike just never really felt like um, that was the right way to go for the band. So as they went off and had a hit record, it was like a number one in the country. They're touring on this thing. Brian, while living in this house, um, in 1965 had met Van Dyke Parks over at Terry Melcher's house and I conferred with Scott Michaels and that's very likely the uh, the house that Sharon Tate was murdered in. He had met Van Dyke Parks up there and Van Dyke was a lyricist and Brian really liked the way that he talked and said, you know, are you, are you good with writing lyrics for songs? And Van Dyke said, yeah, I can do that. So they decided to start working together for what would become the Smile Sessions. Now Brian was using, uh, they were smoking hash and pot and doing LSD and stuff like that periodically throughout these sessions, but everyone involved said 
those weren't an issue that that the the drugs were not an issue for brian it's become like kind of a um a stigma around his neck because his father had him investigated at that time but um they had he had hired private detectives and everything to spy on brian but brian didn't actually you know that wasn't anything that hindered him um in fact at this time he like i said he was producing records a couple a year and hits every couple of months so while they were living here van dyke i told you there was a story about coming up this hill. The first time Van Dyke was supposed to come up and work with Brian, he was late. And when he got here, Brian kind of reprimanded him and said, like, why are you late? I want to work on this stuff at this time. And Van Dyke had like a, like a little motor scooter. And he said, Brian, you know, my scooter's having trouble getting up the hill. And Brian just had never caught, you know, he just didn't know that world. He had never considered that. So he felt so bad that apparently he bought Van Dyke a car to get him up here. So they started working on things here and they wanted to have a whimsical, creative, fun environment. That was the whole thing. Brian felt that spirituality and great moments in life came from unadulterated fun. So he was trying to make music that was almost, it was a pop symphony, but he also wanted it to just make you enjoy life. And so some of the things that were talked about that happened here was that, um, well, they had a pool installed and Brian and Marilyn had their name um, carved into the sidewalk out there at the pool. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But um, Brian would have the band members and people that he was co-writing and, and working with on this, his friends. He had made new friends since he was living up here that the Beach Boys didn't know and they were helping in the creative process. So he would have them um, swimming in the pool and having meetings in the pool, having fun. He at one point had um, tumbling mats laid out all over the living room and wanted people to get in shape and wanted them to, uh, to be tumbling all over the living room floor. And then they said at one point he wanted to have a sandbox. He wanted to feel like he was at the beach. So they built a sandbox in the living room, put his Steinway piano in there, and he would play in his bare feet. And he said he actually wrote some of his favorite songs from Smile on there. He, in there, he wrote Cabin Essence, Wonderful, um, Surf's Up, and I believe Heroes and Villains. And Heroes and Villains was one that Brian said, when I sat down and started writing it, I actually could just feel my hands moving over the keys on their own. He said, like something was working through me. He said, he even wrote it in C sharp. That wasn't something he normally did. But this album in particular, he was experimenting more with, instead of just creating a song by song thing, he was creating all these little moments that he would piece together to create songs. So this house is where he created good vibrations. He would put that together in pieces here and that would become one of the most advanced songs of its time and one of the biggest selling songs of its time. In fact, that was kind of his concern with what he was making here. The music was so amazing and it was just so uh, different. He was having people mimic barnyard animals and he was using slide whistles and he was doing all kinds of fun things. Um, like I said, you know, he built a sandbox in here. He had tumbling mats. At one point he had them build an Arabian tent in the living room so that they could have little powwows and little meetings. And then when it finally was built, he didn't want any light coming from the top or anything. So there was no vent at the top. And they went in there and they were having their little like powwow, smoked hash, and nobody could breathe. <laughs> so the tent, though it took all this time to build, they rarely found any use for it. But that was just kind of like the creative process that they were going through. They said nobody ever was like, oh, Brian's doing drugs and he's crazy. That was never the feeling. The feeling was always like, you know, this is fun. He's creating fun, unadulterated fun. And so when they would go to the studio, he would get really great moments out of the musicians. Now the problem happened when one of the songs they're recording Brian felt that it ended up causing a lot of trouble. He wrote a song that was called Mrs. O'Leary's Cow and it was named after the cow that started the Chicago fire. So this song was actually, it has been come down to be known as fire. And um, when they were in there reading it, they had firemen's helmets on and slide whistles and they created this sound and everything. But Brian found out that down the road, like a couple blocks away from where they recorded it that same night, a factory burned down. And he was convinced that something that they had created in the music that night had 
cause that to happen and so he started to get a little bit paranoid now he was also spending a great deal of time working on this album like i said they usually put out a couple albums a year and in this case he had been already working on the recording of this for six months and even though good vibrations was released and it was a hit he still hadn't finished this and it was 1966 pet sounds had come out and they had already announced that smile was coming out in january of 67 so he had a lot of pressure on him and he actually said he felt that he needed a full other year just to finish it. But when the Beach Boys came back from tour and they heard what he was working on, that created a problem. Brian played the music for the guys and he said he knew that it was very advanced for the time, so he thought that they might have some reservations about it, but he said Mike just didn't like it at all. Mike didn't get any of the lyrics, didn't want to do it, didn't see the Beach Boys performing it. and. To his credit, I can kind of understand where he's coming from. If you were the guy that had to perform it live, it probably wouldn't feel cool doing barnyard animal sounds and things like that. But the music was great. Like I said, Heroes and Villains, um, Cabin Essence, Surf's Up, all that stuff. It was so great that it, I mean, Brian said eventually he, had, he would work with the guys and it became almost strenuous to work with them. Um, Dennis was gung-ho to do it. Carl was gung-ho to do it, but Mike didn't like it, and Brian said it just felt like when he would try and teach them the lyrics and teach them the parts, they just weren't getting it. It wasn't coming together, and Mike was so vocal about not liking it that that was wearing on Brian because he's someone who always needed support. That's why he, you know, he married his wife when they were so young. Is he needed somebody always in his corner that supported what he was doing, and... Um, he just wasn't getting it from the Beach Boys the way he needed it. And then he was paranoid, like I said, about the fire from Mrs. O'Leary's cow. And he was also paranoid that um, his father was having the house bugged. And so he started having all of his meetings in the pool where he thought they couldn't bug it. He wouldn't talk on the phone, didn't want, you know, he thought the walls were bugged. He thought everything was bugged, the studios. And um, eventually he just said he lost interest in doing the project even though um, they had been promoting how great this record was gonna be and Van Dyke Parks had made some amazing lyrics, they just got tired of defending it to the other members of the band. And Brian said, you know, when the other guys started fighting me on it and opposing it, you know, I thought, well, maybe it is just ahead of its time. Maybe it's too far advanced or maybe, you know, he said eventually the Beach Boys kind of felt like it is a good record. It's just not us. It's not what we want to do. So Brian ended up basically falling into a depression that led to a full on breakdown. And like I said, his friend said they've never credited the, the breakdown or any of his problems to the drugs. They said the drugs became a problem later, but it was because of the breakdown, him not having the support, him feeling that he hadn't, um, wasn't going to get to make this masterpiece that he had put so much time into. He even said, he said, I could have finished it with just my voice, but I wanted the Beach Boy blend on there. And so for years, the album had been talked about and never came out and there were just demos of Brian doing all the vocal parts and when I moved out here I told my friend who turned me on to pet sounds man I wish I could hear what smile was like and he said I have a bootleg of it I'll mail it to you and he did and I got to hear it it was like 31 tracks and it was so cool I totally understand where they say that um it was a lot of like snippets and pieces that they put together to make the songs and but it was done intentionally that way so it has a real interesting vibe to it now what's cool is i mentioned that um brian and marilyn had put their name in the concrete out by the pool i guess in the 90s the people that bought this house decided to renovate the pool area and they removed that slab of cement and they had it out here i guess laying up against the side of the house so that fans could see it and one day a guy was on his honeymoon and um was visiting here and the homeowner came out and saw him and said you know what are you doing she, he said i'm a big beach boys fan and everything she said i'll sell that to you for a thousand dollars and i guess that's what she had paid to have it removed when she was tearing up everything they had to have it removed and whatever they wanted to save it so she offered it to him for a thousand dollars he said he declined it but then the next day came back with 500 
offered it to her and she gave it to him. So he has it. And if you look on Facebook, you can find in different groups, he's posted a photo of it. And it says August 22nd of 1966, which makes me think it would have been right around like a one year anniversary of them buying this house. So kind of cool that uh, what used to be out there, the fan now has, a, a fan is now keeping in his possession. He said he pretty much hurt his back um, hauling it because he said the slab of cement was so big it was like the size of um, what you would see at Grauman's Chinese Theater. So that house is it. That's the one that my favorite record of all time, Pet Sounds, would have been worked on. Good vibrations and smile. And then I believe in late 67 they moved out of here and moved to Bellagio, but I guess the pool would have been right back over there. And one of the other problems they said they had with the, when Brian put the sandbox in was that he had two dogs and the dogs started using the sandbox as, well, basically like a litter box. So, wow. If you've never heard Pet Sounds, definitely go listen to it. And if you have Spotify, even though they're not a sponsor, you can hear the original Smile Sessions demos from 1966 that was supposed to come out in 67. You can actually hear those. And then, like I said, when Brian had his touring band in the 2000s in early, I believe it was 2010, the band talked him into revisiting those sessions and said, you know, we can bring that fun and that enjoyment back. And so when they would perform it live, they did have like a lot of hand gestures and you could tell they were having fun playing this and so Brian finally got his Smile album out and that was why it was called Smile. He said that he and Van Dyke just wanted to have a title and a cover that just made people feel positive right away. So there you go. You just can't go wrong with pet sounds. You just can't. It's beautiful beginning to end. So sadly in the end the lack of support was what stopped that album from coming out. Kind of crazy to think of. Then in 1967, the Beach Boys sued Capitol Records and the people that were basically helping Brian, like Van Dyke Parks and um, David Anderley. Those guys all decided not to be involved anymore with the Beach Boys camp, and that's pretty much what made Brian have his breakdown. So after all this is when Brian had that period of time where he didn't leave the bed paint this period as though it was a rivalry between the Beach Boys and the Beatles, but it wasn't really. They both admired each other's work. Uh, Brian was just kind of smart enough to hire the Beach Boys publicist during this time, and the publicist started putting it out there that, you know, the Beach Boys were in competition with the Beatles and that, you know, he kind of started making comparisons out in the media of the two, and that's what really got it going. All right, we made a trip out to the park. It's windy and it's about to start raining, but I wanted to do it because it's supposed to rain for like the next three days, so he doesn't like to go out in the rain. This might be his only chance. Here he comes. Hello, buddy, hello. Oh, he's found some friends. That right there makes it all worth it. So if you're looking for some recommended Beach Boys tracks from this time, um, Pet Sounds, I would highly recommend. God Only Knows, Wouldn't It Be Nice. Um, That's Not Me, I Just Wasn't Made For These Times, Let's Go Away For A While. And of course on Smile, Good Vibrations, Cabin Essence, Heroes and Villains, Surf's Up, Wonderful, um, Wind Chimes. The whole, actually both albums all the way through, perfect. Starting to sprinkle again. And not just from him. Not that kind of sprinkling. All right, my friends, we are gonna call it a day. I hope you enjoyed this vlog today. If you were looking for some music to check out and you've never heard those, I hope you check out Pet Sounds and Smile. Thank you Tad Dillard and Beverly Orlando Stuchel for becoming my newest Patreons. Thank you all for watching and we'll see you all next time. Have a great night and goodbye.